Zia, she is a geoscientist passionate about championing equitable, science-driven, and ambitious climate change solutions. She started her career in energy industry as a geophysicist, assessing pre-drilled geohazard risks in several offshore oil fields. Through her master thesis, she delivered policy recommendation to Texas General Land Office based on experimental results in geoscience and reservoir simulation in order to optimize carbon capture and storage operation. During her fellowship at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, she helped characterize CO2 storage site in Northern California and collated static storage capacity on the depleted gas field. She's currently assisting energy companies to accelerate their CCS project and help decarbonize the oil and gas industry with TerraTech. She will be today talking about the remaining challenges in underground storage of the CO2. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Melania Ulfa. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'll get started by sharing my screen. Sure. All right. Um, so as the title suggested, I will share um, basically what I learned so far um, from my learning and research experience about the challenges in underground, underground search of CO2. So, sorry. The first challenge is actually pretty personal. So this is the question that I get asked a lot as uh, every time I tell people that I work for underground CO2 storage. So mostly I tell them about um, or like comparing it with other technology, such as what's suggested by, um, I believe someone earlier suggests about um, put the CO2 into space. I believe at least for geoscientists, we're more familiar with the idea of storing CO2 underground um, from, from the idea perspective, from the technological perspective. Uh, so that's the reason why. And to say that CO2 storage is actually, I mean, considerably a new term, but the technology is actually has been around for 50 years. Um, I believe the first one is the Sacra oil field. I don't know if there is an older project than that. So I can say that the technology is actually pretty major. So because of its close relationship with the oil and gas industry, we get to adopt some of the um, concepts from oil and gas industry, such as the reservoir, the cap rug, and re recently also learned that the migration laws that commonly occur in petroleum industry, um, that's undesirable for them, but it is actually desirable for CO2 storage because it means that we can have an additional storage space for that. And again, because of its close ties to petroleum industry, there's an opportunity for, for us um, to reuse some facilities, such as the wells, the rig the platforms the pipeline even so we know that there must be some treatments that must be done to those facilities before we use them for the purpose of co2 storage so now we get to the actual challenge um the first obstacle or the common obstacle that i encounter a lot at the beginning of every project is the data availability um, sure, the data is out there, but sometimes the data come with a price. And sometimes for students or early professional is just unreachable for us. So what I learned so far is that there are, there are several public available data that we can access. Um, commonly, it's from, um, it's from a state-owned website, I can say. And if, if I couldn't find any data from that, um, or if you cannot find any data that you're, that you're looking for, there's an, a more affordable option for well data, um, such as state on research institution. I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin, so my recommendation would be Bureau of Economic Geology, but again, it might depend on which area you're working on. So again, um, let's say that we already have the data, we have the well data, we correlated the wells, we have the tops, horizons, we have the seismic data, we got the horizons, we got the fault interpreted, we're ready to make the model, but then we still feel like we don't know enough about this area. Like we don't know if, we, we're not sure if we can use this area for CO2 storage. We, we're not sure that we can propose this area. Maybe because there's no exploration history, maybe because, um, the reservoir quality is not good enough, or even if there's any reservoir at all. So what worked for me so far is to look regionally, and of course it will work for like on any other geoscience related project as well, and just gather any information that you get 
from there. Um, for instance, as as um, as subtle as like the positional environment or the azimuth direction, because there's no such thing as perfect model, um, in my opinion. But the goal for this is to make your model as realistic as possible. Because if you have a realistic model, it will increase your confidence to show that the fluid will, where the fluid will go, where the fluid will migrate, and it will go a long way when we have the discussion for the area of review when it comes to CO2 storage. So we talk about the static, now we move into the dynamic region of the CO2 storage. Um, we have the geologic data, now we are ready to do the simulation, let's say, but like how much injection that is suitable, how much injection is ideal for this area? So before we talk about the rate, um, let's talk about storage capacity first. So beside the um, dimension of the reservoir or your injection target and also the petrophysical properties such as porosity and permeability, mm -hmm. the storage capacity is also influenced by efficiency factor. And as you can see from the efficiency factor formula over here, it's it depends much on the pressure buildup. And we know that pressure buildup will be different from one side to another, from one reservoir to another, even, even in one side, but like you're picking a different formation or um, zone of interest, it could also be different because it depends on the initial reservoir pressure and also the um, fracture pressure that you're going to calculate from your well data. Um, for instance, this data is from one of the research by Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And because of the nature of the reservoir that they chose for this study, they can only, they can only use um, the efficiency factor from the range of one to two percent. Different from this study that's based on one area in the Gulf of Mexico because of, again, because of the nature of the geology, they can use as much as 40% of efficiency factor for um, the storage capacity. So now we answer um, the question of how much, but about how fast, like, let's say that we want to um, solve the climate change as, as fast as we can. So why not just inject as, as fast as we can. So what about we add more wells? Would it help? Would it even, um, even increase the capacity? Well, one of my research results that I, I actually did not um, try to solve this problem, but like on the way there, I just sort of solved this problem. Um, so the number of the injection wells um, does not necessarily increase the injectivity of the well. So this is one of the example. Um, if you can see my pointer, this is with one well, you can you can inject as much as 60 million tons of CO2, but if you increase the number of the well um, with four wells over, sorry, with four wells over here, you can inject as much as 60.8 million tons of CO2, which means that each well can only inject as much as 15.2 million tons of CO2. So that's like, a that's a, very large decrease of injectivity. Um, what I'm saying is that um, in one elevated pressure area, um, when it comes to um, the rate, when it comes to the um, how much we want to inject, how, how fast we want to inject, it all depends on the pressure and it's different from side to side. But at least we have some, some sense of how we can decide it from the data that we have. So now we move on to the monitoring. Um, this is pretty challenging, like more challenging than I, I personally feel like monitoring is the most challenging part of CO2 storage. Maybe because I've actually never been um, involved directly to any monitoring project. Um, but I believe that the main goal of monitoring is to prove there are no leaks, but it's simple because if there's no leaks, there will be no disturbance. You will, um, the project that you have will run smoothly. There's no delay and you will get the tax incentive as much as you expected it to be because the amount of CO2 that you reported to, that you report that was injected is the same as the amount of the CO2 that you propose to inject. 
And to break it into three efforts, um, what we can do is to optimize detection, eliminate the impacts that we can see in the beginning, and also mitigate unacceptable events occur because, well, sorry, because, uh, we can't really positive about something. So we just gotta, we just gotta assess those works and try to see how we can mitigate unacceptable events. So um, when it comes to monitoring, I, um, divided into two parts. So the first one is the deep subsurface monitoring. So basically the monitoring to um, look at how the plume looks like or how it's being distributed. Like if it, if it, if it, um, if it confirms the shape of the plume that we um, forecast from the reservoir simulation, if it, um, if it, turns out to be larger than the area of review. But the challenging part of that is that there's always the noise, whether you're doing the measurement directly or indirectly. Like the wireline logging tools is one of the methods for directly um, monitoring the plums and also some deployment in well tools. We can see um, maybe from, from from the equipment or from the data that we'll receive also in geophysical data to figure out. Um, I know that some, some projects are doing, I think 3D seismic, um, time-lapse seismic data, something like that to know like the development or the evolution of the plume time to time. And as a geophysicist, we, we just can't, we just can't get away from noises and we just have to deal with it in order for us to know which one, which, which one is the anomaly, which one is a real data, I mean, just a noise. And one of the suggestions that I learned um, recently about monitoring is to focus on the well area, especially the, the abandoned well area, because most leaks are happening to abandoned wells. And as you can see from the diagram, there's like a step-by-step -step how the CO2 can escape from the cement, or if there's a plug failure, it would just simply go up to the surface, so. The second monitoring is the environmental monitoring. So I believe this is this is more like to see if there's any CO2 that made it into the surface because this particular example is taken from solid gas measurement. And the challenging part of this monitoring is that the CO2 concentration, because because we're we're measuring the CO2 concentration in the soil. So it's up in here in the surface, not not really far in the subsurface like we talked about earlier. So there are so many factors that influence the CO2 concentration up here, like the seasons, like um, when it's springtime or summertime, there are more leaves. So there are more photosynthesis. So the CO2 is not as, the CO2 concentration is not as high as let's say during winter or during fall when the trees don't have leaves at all and it, the, the photosynthesis doesn't help. So what I, what I learned from, from this environmental monitoring is, uh, aside from acquiring the baseline data, is also um, learn about the variation of um, the variation of the variation itself. Like this one is a variation of the temperature and other other um, factors that could influence the concentration of the CO two. And sometimes sometimes it's not that easy to find a pattern and. Um, see that again, if this is based on this is um, natural fluctuation of the CO2 or if it's anomaly. But what I can say is that um, lots of people are working on it um, to make it easier to, um, to detect an anomaly that can suggest that there is a leakage in CO2 storage area. So um, I guess the same with the characterization, the monitoring is also depend the monitoring also depends on the site. So it's very site specific. Um, every site has their own, own treatment, their own methods to be done, their own timeline, their own frequency of monitoring. And what I found in one of my research is also um, even in one geologic area, if you put the well in a different point of the model, it can also yield different results. Um, and this one that I show to you is the average reservoir pressure. So it actually suggests how, how, how much time it needs for the pressure to come back to the normal or like to the initial reservoir pressure. And it definitely has something to do with your monitoring timeline, monitoring frequency, and how long are you gonna do the monitoring? Um, aside from some requirements from the EPA that I believe is 50 years. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
So the final question is, how do you know that you know enough? Well, to put it in a simple way, um, there are two answers. You never know, but you also always know enough. Because if you use all of your data, you analyze all of your data as much as you can, you maximize, you maximize what you have, you'll always know enough. The Slapno project, they started the injection in 1996. And this study was published in 2004. This actually depicts the SRSN. And they basically predict that the CO2 plume will migrate like this. But then years later, after many, many, many efforts of monitoring, many, many attempts to try to reimage how the plume looks like the slab surface, it gives a completely different image of the plume. So I guess this is also helpful for like confirming um, what you have and like just keep updating your model to see to see the um, how your plume will, will you know go into the evolution. So that being said, um, I believe that I've been talking about um, the science part of the challenge. Well, we have lots of challenges in CO2 storage and um, there are multiple ways to address them and it's site specific, but one thing that I, well, a couple things that I missed to say is that the, a couple things that also applies as a solution for every challenge that I address is collaboration and action. Well, collaboration, of course, it, it, it applies to everything since the acquiring the data we need collaboration with other people because um, it's hard to do everything by ourselves, of course, and action as much as simple as, um, you know, talk, speaking out your idea to people, um, suggesting idea, um, or even just as simple as talk about it to your friends who are not geoscientists, just just let them know that such technology exists and it's for climate change and it's not as, as scary as they imagine it to be. So... Um, thank you for listening to me rambling about my, about what I learned about CO2 storage challenges. I'll be happy to answer any questions or if anyone also wants to share their challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miliana, for the presentation. It was very informative. So actually we have one comment from uh, Reza. He says that the figure that shows the number of wells versus the capacity is specific to one case. Maybe he want to know which case is that uh, let like me the see. number of injection well vs capacity oh number of injection wells versus yes. capacity. oh yeah so sorry it was actually based on one study like what i said earlier i did not like i found this finding by accident like i never intended to like figure out this fact um so yeah i didn't get to experiment with other data from other fields but i believe that there is a logic that the more number the more wells that you have it will probably increase the capacity especially if you have fields like this with multiple faults like we know that faults in co2 storage i think faults can be both blessing or curse it's a blessing if the fault is ceiling because you know, it makes the plume does not migrate as far, but this occurs, of course, if um, the fault is transmissive or it can be a pathway for the CO2 to move to, to migrate upwards. So let's say that the faults that we have in our area is actually ceiling. So um, if you inject the CO2 over here because the faults are ceiling, the CO2 can't move around. So you can't really use the space over here. So you gotta, you gotta drill more wells. Um, and to, to like increase the capacity so that you can use the pore space in the neighboring area. And so that's that's what, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's site specific, it could be, it could be, but like when it comes to an area like this life that I showed earlier, like area with no fault, um, with no trap, and basically the elevated pressure is uniformly distributed throughout the area. And if you put more wells, it would only, it would increase. And like the other wells also um, injecting CO2, it would increase the pressure and it will come close to the fracture pressure and eventually limit your rate. And that's why it decreased your um, injectivity in one well. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Jesus. He says that, is there a difference in injectivity characteristics or conditions between depleted oil and gas field and saline aquifer? 
Um, I believe that again, every 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 question to relate to CO two storage would be site specific and um must be must be answered through a research. This is this is a great question for research actually. Um, so the question, I mean, the answer, I personally don't know, but um, I think it could be different if it depends on the area that you're targeting at, um, because I mean, characterization wise, depleted gas, in the, if you're using depleted gas fields, you, you're already familiar with the reservoir, you have enough data for it, you have the um, production history, you, you have the exact number of the reservoir pressure, so you, so you know you have more confidence of how much you can inject into the reservoir and how fast you can inject the reservoir, different to saline aquifer. But the thing with, the thing with using the depleted reservoir is that it's an, it's an exploration area. So we can expect that there are multiple wells around it. Um, and like, as one of my slides suggested earlier, most leakage um, happen in, I mean, occur in abandoned well area. So I guess it, it has both its, its risk. Um, so again, um, not the definitive answer, but um, it, Maybe it might help to like to like decide on which 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 side you you would want to choose. Yeah, thank you very much. Another question is to what extent we can trust our reservoir model to predict uh, the caprock integrity or how much pore space we have to store? Because generally, in, when we are dealing with oil and gas reservoir, we mm -hmm. have the data to calibrate the production mm -hmm. data. Sometimes we have you have used like extensive core data and well login. What about in carbon storage project? How can we calibrate our reservoir model? Well, to calibrate your reservoir model, you absolutely need to do the injection and like confirm how the plume will look like, like just like the Sleipner, just the Sleipner project. But if you have, let's say, um, unrestricted time and unrestricted budget, I have this, backup slide that I prepared. Um, so this might give you an idea um, about like multiple stage or multiple choices um, for characterization in CO2 storage. So um, the more complicated your model is, or I, would, well, I wouldn't say complicated, um, maybe the process is complicated, but I think it increased the I mean, it, it makes the model closer to reality. It makes the closer much more realistic because of um, more added um, components into it. So I'm sorry, I lost it. Yeah, it depends. It depends on your goal, I guess. So like if it's if you're still in the characterization, characterization phase of your project, um, Again, what you, it, 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 it depends on your time constraint and it depends on your budget too of how, how much data can you, can you obtain or can you afford to refine your model. But if it's an ongoing project, you can do what the Slavner project do, that is to you know, keep, keep acquiring seismic every, every few years um, and, like con and, like making, and like just experiment with everything. Another, another option is to um, do sensitivity analysis. That's like um, running multiple simulations and look at the average or something like that. But I'm pretty skeptical about that because like if we can, if we can increase, the, um, increase our confidence by using geologic data, why not? Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, basically, uh, yeah. So basically, we are now out of questions. If you have any comments, that would be okay. Okay, so thank you so much.